All right, so let's talk about an introduction to user interface and visual design principles. So what is user interface design? Designing the experience, uh, the way in which some human interacts with technologies. Yeah, we can take that, yeah, very good. So it could be anything really, graphical user interface, app design, website design. It's determining how the product looks, how the look and feel, the aesthetics presenting and organizing all the aesthetic elements in a uh, logical and clear way. I always imagine it as the very visual aspect of the design. So what the user is interacting with via buttons, windows, colors. Yeah, exactly. Things. It's like also ensuring that the visual language that the designer chooses fits the product, fits the, the user base fits the, the client's goals as well as the, the company goals rather as well as the user goals and making sure that what you the user experience that you produce is incorporates the company and the product brand elements as well you have to take into account the uh, the branding side the visual identity of the who whoever you're making the, the product for making sure that it all fits so that's a little bit more lean towards visual design but, but yeah good how about some differences between user interface and user experience design the difference with the user experience and the user interface, the user experience doesn't always have to be visual. Um, it's a little bit broader, I suppose. And then the oh. interface, I think of it more like there's always, there's like physically something, but the experience, I don't know, could be much more like lasting, ongoing, but, you know, beyond just that, the very first impression and, you know, things like that. Yeah. So the user experience kind of relates to all aspects of, a product or company or whoever from you know from the very first interaction that you have with them through to mm -hmm. how you communicate with your customers and your users so it's everything regardless of, of the actual app it's, it's going through the whole process how the users feel how they come out at the other end how, how they're feeling and basically what they're experiencing um yeah so good uh, anybody else any ideas this is my teaching technique just like throw it all to you so i don't have to do anything <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> I guess in like user experience design is maybe like focused on driving users to certain behaviors more so than like like the user interface, like that's just like how they can go about using the product and stuff. Yeah, so it's more strategic. I, I like to think of it as like it's it's more critical thinking or it leans more towards critical thinking. Problem solving, the user interface design leans more towards the um, creative side. Thinking about what's perhaps what a um, user interface designer might be involved with, like a deeper research into the user goals, competitor research, competitor analysis, and persona creation, and creating user flows and the user journeys and site maps. More of the, the, the strategic side of things. It's obviously crossover because a, a UX designer might create you know, wireframes, prototypes, design, ideation, and coordinating. They would coordinate more with stakeholders and owners perhaps a bit more than a, a UI designer might do. Whereas UI design is probably, again, like we said, focusing more on the look and feel and tying it in with branding guidelines and working out the layout and, and working more with like the graphic illustration, iconography, that kind of thing, typography. And they would coordinate more with developers, you guys more so to make sure that you guys are implementing things as they should be. All right, so I think we've done some similarities. What makes a good user interface? Memorability or, um, well, ease of use. Yeah, ease, of use. ease of use is associated with memorability, I think. Something that is um, presented and built in a way that makes the user want to suggest it to other users and the user want to return back. So yeah, so clarity is probably the most important. It clearly conveys the message, the purpose for the users. Um, it doesn't distract, so the UI, the UI shouldn't just be distracting. It should allow users to easily achieve their goals without causing any friction. Familiarity as well could be one. You could have something, create something wild and new, but for the most part, you want to you want you, your interface to be familiar, so it doesn't cause any stress. You know, users can draw on their existing previous experience from other app interactions, so they can get to what they need. 
forgiveness is a term that was often used. So forgive the users for their mistakes, guide them, provide clear instructions and helpers and tool tips and onboarding, you know, auto save functions or whatever, I don't know, whatever else you might have. Is I not have users stress out if they can't get what they what they need to get. <laughs> kind of finding that sweet spot too between explaining how the interface works and then just not nagging the user as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. Yes. So balance, exactly. Balance is a really important part in terms of like visuals and just the presenting the, the content and the, the flow. So no, you're right. And I guess, yeah, just um, efficiency, I suppose, isn't it? So people can just get to what they need to get to with as little fuss as possible, basically. Internal consistency. And I guess that kind of fits into the familiarity thing, but just if we're going to do a button one way, probably want to do it the same way, I would think. Consistency. Very good. Yes, you're right. And that was on my list, but I forgot to say it. <laughs> like you go through a wizard and then the last one, the last step, they switch the colors of the buttons to try and prevent you. Yeah, they do. And you, like on your phone, when they're trying to force the, you to, uh, your, your phone software, I swear they switch the buttons on you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sneaky, sneaky tactics. I'm not yeah. down with that. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, okay, hierarchy. We're talking about visual hierarchy and referring to uh, the importance of elements within a design. It's a way of visually ranking the content and so that you know it leads the user naturally through your product. Why do we need it? So without visual hierarchy, we don't, uh, you know, there's no clear path for users to follow and you, you're left uh, wandering the page for the information that you need. Sometimes you look at a website or an app or something and everything just kind of flows naturally can't put your finger on it but it's like it's just really nice just everything's really smooth that's basically you, you know that the, the whoever's designed this they, they really nailed the the hierarchy of the, the content the visuals and the balance and so you know you're, you're onto a, a good app there two sort of common paths on the way that you read it is things like uh, is z-shaped patterns and f-shaped patterns one disclaimer here is that a lot of my visual um samples here are are kind of more towards uh web UI rather than app UI, but the principles remain the same. It's just what I had on hand at the time. I've recently been working on a lot of websites as well. So it was just kind of in my mind. So let's look at F-shaped patterns. So F-shaped patterns are common for information dense content. So web browser would be a perfect one to search results. Let's, let's look at how people read information in the West anyway. We read from top to bottom, left to right. And so you can see people are reading from top to bottom, left to right, and then they and then they then scan down the page for the information that they, they need. And then maybe they'll hit another section and go across again. And it's basically creating this kind of like F shape, or in this case, it's more like an E, this F shaped pattern. So you can make sure that all when you're positioning your elements on your page, you can make sure that um, the most important information is all left aligned and prominent. Like the first line, the first lines of text will often you know, get a, a glance. And uh, it means you, you, that your call to actions have got a better chance of being interacted with if you kind of bear this sort of pattern in mind for, for, for content heavy pages. Here's an example of its kind of interaction. It's not such a heavy page, but we've got like a, a this F shape kind of pattern going on here with this land page for Lyft. Do you, so when you're like looking at land page design and things like that, um, Lyft and Uber, they're always they're always changing them up. Um, I actually was trying to get a Z-shaped pattern when I went to Lyft, but they've since changed it. So they're always testing and and working out which one works better within the, the UI. Let's move on to Z-shaped. So this one you'd be more familiar with. Again, the user's travels, eyes travel across the top and then diagonally back down and then across and diagonally down and across. With Dropbox, you've got the headline navigation along the top. And then you scan back down to this image. I'm not sure what their new images are about, but, and then back across again, you sign up. And so, and then the button placement is right at the end of the Z, which is where you're kind of, you, in this case, your sweet spot for to click, click in that interaction. You could also maybe have it over this side as people are traveling down, have it kind of mid page to the left, very common. And yeah, so it just allows you to be more strategic in your placement of your UI elements. Again, Facebook, same same deal. Um, you've got the, at the end of the, the point here, of the top of the Z, you've got the login interaction and then right and then kind of scans through to your sign up. 
yeah, so we can better direct the users basically to where you want them to go instead of randomly placing your, your UI elements. Again, this is full of full of the Zs across here, down diagonal, try now buttons there. And again, when you're laying out the content, it's this Z shape pattern in action. Even down on the FAQs, you, scan, you come through, you read the content, you scan back to try it out. Good visual hierarchy is created through all of these sort of principles. Um, contrast and balance being very important. And then, the, in fact, the rest actually kind of just fall into hierarchy, contrast and balance. So shape and size and shape, color, typography, white space, patterns and consistency. So those the Z and F shape patterns, those are dictated largely by the um, left to right reading, correct? Yeah. What are the patterns and what do the sites look like when they're mainly in, in Japanese or a language that reads in a different direction? Uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, that's a good question. And one that, like, for the most part, Japanese, Japanese love to cram they look, at, they look to give you information overload. So here's an example of a leading electrical store over here. There's a lot going on now and everything's tiny. It's actually a culture thing because even the print design is the same. I mean, this is a, one of my kids, this is one of my kids' magazine covers. <laughs> and it goes through, and it even goes through to the TV as well, you know, subtitles for everything and icons and graphics. So I always thought it was the reasons, you know, a technical thing. I think there was a company, I can't remember who it was, it was a, a Western company, they moved into over into Japan, they saw these ghastly flyers, I can't remember what these, these flyers have got a name, they're full of, they're just absolutely full of offers, and they were like, first thing we do is we're going to scrap these, and we're going to do some Western ones, and then sales like dropped dramatic, uh, dr dramatically from them doing this, they waded in with their Western ideas and, <laughs> and changed the design. And so they had to end up bringing it back because, you know, it is, it is a culture thing. So in terms of reading patterns, I, I don't know if, if it's reversed or if it's even thought about, to be honest. And things are so sparse sometimes, like if you have a little, you know, a flower pot or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So. It's funny because even like a company, there's a company called Muji and they, I'm looking at their US site right now and it's, it's, it's Western. Um, mm. But if I go to their Japanese site, it's like the design of the site is completely different. Totally different. It's yeah. like Uniqlo as well. If you if you're familiar yeah. with, I don't know if Uniqlo is over there. Yeah, the website is completely different for the for the. So it's quite interesting. Yeah, Muji. Actually, to be fair, Muji is not bad at, uh, at having clear UI and uh, usability kind of ideas. So contrast, so how elements relate to each other. So we're not talking about color contrast here. Obviously, color contrast is important, but we're talking about how all, how everything differs or relates to each other. And, and we use that contrast to, comp uh, to co create compelling visual hierarchies. So let's like quickly have a look at, um, let's quickly go back to our list. What can we think for contrast with, I don't know, size and shape? easy you know kind of big big or small drawing emphasis from the different uh, shapes now we've got color contrast i guess bright bright and dark typography again is contrast with um font weights font styles actual you know font choice um, white space again contrast between large areas of white space giving giving elements room to breathe drawing emphasis on an element from by, by you know creating space around it or tight space which you know could kind of create some chaos but could be used in some cases yeah so contrast basically applies to everything else so let's keep that in the back of our mind as we as we move through the other principles and try and always remember that kind of core idea of contrast and balance as well so you know all, all design elements carry a visual weight a cost when you're composing your layouts your elements should all create a sense of balance. So balance is like unity and harmony. Yeah, so it's always a good idea to think about balance when you're working on your layouts. Sometimes you can get really sucked into what you're doing and it's good to just get go away, have a cup have a cup of coffee or whatever, come back and you know and think about is it is it balanced? <laughs> Take it again, is the composition working? Am I drawing attention to something that I shouldn't be drawing attention to? And is my viewer, you know, am I, am I leading my viewer through 
the app, through the application, through the interface where I need them to, to be. And so without balance, we have, um, we have visual tension. So let's look at a really obvious, some obvious examples. So which of these, so one of these is kind of creating tension as you look at it. And one of them is balanced more harmoniously. And I, th I think we know that the left one, the alignment's all out of whack, the buttons are butted up against the content that we've got alignment issues. So even just something as simple as just aligning your elements, you know, and it's like, it's not hard, hit that align button. <laughs> it's all, I mean, I even see other designers struggling with it. And, it, and especially when you're, in a, when you're in a rush, you know, because everything's iterated so quickly, particularly when you're, you're doing like, you, you, like your lo-fi wireframes and what have you, you, you're trying to get it in front of the client quickly and you've kind of cut corners with just good practice for balance in your composition, particularly if I'm doing wireframes, I mean, because it depends what you're designing. But, but I just try and keep out of habit more so perhaps. I just keep set heights for say vertical spacing i'll go from like i don't know maybe between an element between a title and a, and a content block i'll just have it 40 pixels so i just know to just nudge it down four times and i just always keep that number in my head maybe if i want to a bit more emphasis i'll nudge it down 80 pixels for example or if i'm doing it shorter i'll i know that i like elements to be like say, say the top header and the, and the main header i might have it 16 or 8 pixels and I just keep these same numbers in my head in bootstrap with the spacers So if you do MB 3 that's a spacer of 1 if you do MB 4 It's like a spacer of 1.5 and MB 5 is like a spacer of 3 and it's doing exactly so bootstrap That framework has exactly what you're talking about and when you really like plowing through some wireframes it's, It is really easy to just not bother and the more pages you create though the more it becomes then a headache to fix it depends who you didn't feel like, because if I'm creating wireframes, I usually know that I'm going to be the one that's designing it. So it's in my best interest to, although the wireframes aren't supposed to be, you know, the actual design itself. Once we get into like high fidelity wires, I know that kind of this placement is getting pretty solid now. And so I'll try and have at least spacing mapped out so that then when I come to doing my actual design, I don't have to work as hard kind of thing. So I like to keep those those ideas of spacing and alignment in mind. And then again, maybe I would double, say that 80 pixels I said before, maybe I'd double it for white space between sections or something like that. So, and uh, and sketch, if you get a hands on sketch, there's a lot of good plugins that you can just have these things automatically stack and, and you can just set it and it will just automate, everything will stack. You can then add more content in and it will just automatically push everything else down. So you don't have to start fiddling around to get more stuff in. It's really great for quickly smashing out some layout in front of clients. Okay, so we were talking about tension, uh, visual tension with alignments and balance. So for example, this, I really like the content of this box, by the way, I think it's really slick. The logo is great and everything and the, the, the typography. But then the placement of it, it's, it's so close to the edge of the page. It's kind of creating that kind of, that feeling of tension because it's very close to the edge. So if you think about those Z patterns, for example, you come in over here, you're tracking down here, and then your eyes led over into this image. And so you pulled into this, but then this is pulling you away from that kind of call to action. So if it was me, I'd want to move this box over to this side and flip this image so that you're coming down, you're seeing the image, and then you're interacting with the box. But have it, you know, have the balance. So it compositionally, if you think about maybe rule of thirds, for example, is, a, is, a, is an easy, simple way of composition. I guess you, you split this into three. And then you would kind of want to push that towards that kind of third in intersect. So it's not so close to the edge. But then you've got this image as well, because it's not just about the UI placement. It's also, or when it comes to actually actual user interfaces, you're also well, more so visual design, I guess. You've got to think about the images that you're putting in. So then you look at this image, and again, the composition of this photo, it's really close to the edge of this page. So you kind of, when you look at people, you immediately go to their face. And so we're immediately looking at this dead zone at the bottom of the screen. And so you'd want to, if I was doing it, I'd want to choose a, I'd want to choose a, a yoga position where, I don't know, I don't know any yoga positions, <laughs> where I'm leaning forwards maybe with my hand stretched out. Warriors. And I'm facing this way. And I'm pointing my hand and my face and my eyes are going straight into this contact form if you know what I mean. And so you're looking at that face 
and then you follow their hand and their path and it points you right into what you want them to click and so that's would be a and people mess around with this stuff for forever on land pages and you know for conversion and all that kind of stuff but it works for ui as well you know the position of elements do you see on the on the left and the right the padding is smaller than on the top and the bottom is that something we would try to fix or is that not like a general rule we can always follow you think as long as they're consistent I, it doesn't matter if the top and the bottom and the left and the right don't match as long as the top is consistent with the bottom and the left is consistent with the right but then sometimes because when we're talking about the weight of elements sometimes it could look a bit bottom heavy for example you've got that purple button at the bottom and so it feels heavier than the logo at the top and then the fact that the spacing here is kind of similar mm -hmm. it does feel a little bottom heavy so you might want to wait a little bit more um, white space at the bottom just to balance it out even though it's not matched and that kind of goes through to all kinds of that goes through to like framing as well when you're framing photography or a painting quite often you might you might not have even realized you've seen it but you'll see sometimes a frame isn't actually perfectly center it's weighted so there's a little bit more space at the bottom because the image might be feeling a little bottom heavy in the composition so yeah, yeah i'd probably add a little bit more padding at the bottom there but i think the sides are generally it's okay as long as it's not too close to the edge again to, which creates that kind of tension it's all it's all good when we're thinking about balance we have um you have symmetrical balance or asymmetrical balance with your composition. So those symmetrical balances work well with like traditional uh, products, familiar to people that you know you feel that they're trustworthy, everything's all good, and you feel safe, not threatening to, to the to the viewer. Yeah, so Apple often uses very symmetrical elements and it kind of matches their brand ethos as well of beauty and simplicity. And so they match that with how they, they lay out the page and the elements. They do use asymmetry like here, and throughout, but it's always balanced with good use of white space again to keep that weight from from throwing you off. So you can scroll down and you know, we do definitely have obviously asymmetric elements, but it's all well balanced. And again, back to the layout here, which is all nice and symmetrical. Let's have a look at asymmetric. So here's a slide from Adidas. So asymmetric layout within web pages or apps or whatever. It's good for like creating energy and movement, it leads the users around the page where you want them to be by creating this kind of organized chaos where you want it to be. So it's good for like modern brands, energetic brands to draw the eyes to their products. We, they want us to see, they want us to get excited about their the products that they're selling. More pictures of people as well. Let's look at size and shape. So I don't have much to talk about with this one. So again, it's just emphasizing uh, emphasis of elements within the design and just drawing the focal point through size and shape. So obviously this is more prominent visually. We're, we're drawn to it. It then works along with typography as well. So, um, you know, you're keeping your main headings, having a clear hierarchy again, as you, you know, as you're presenting your, your information to the user. Again, with like buttons as well, we've got size and shape goes along with primary and secondary buttons. Um, so there's a visual difference. Size and shape, spacing's not going so well, but size and shape, I mean, I'm drawn to these boxes for sure. So it's about using yeah. shapes to draw your eye where you want it to go. Yeah. So basically like, you know, we, we've got this, this is very large, so we're drawn to that. So yeah, you're all right. Size and shape, mate, I'll give that a tick. All right, color. Firstly, yeah, be consistent. Reserve a color for your call to actions and only use it for call to actions. Make sure it's always consistent. So people, you know, know it, intuitively know where to go with the experience. I mean, yeah, there's a load of stuff for color, like color theory, so that you're not just picking out awful clashing colors. But I mean, it's too big for, for today, isn't it? Color psychology, I guess, to knowing what emotions can be evoked from certain colors and how you can use that to advantage yes, that's important i think for wireframe creation i would just leave color completely out of it i think don't don't give any kind of to your clients so i would keep my wireframes very clean very white uh, monotone oh what else could be yeah important so insufficient color contrast is bad for obviously people with visual impairments so in fact it's more more and more getting becoming very important to focus more on accessibility rather than just what looks great but on as a design, because some quite often, I'm pretty sure this thing that I threw together here would probably fail um, access with the tests with the, with the colors I chose. And there's lots of apps and plugins that you can uh, you can get to, uh, to test the ratio of the colors to see how how they are um, and even how they're seen by 
people with impairments. So it's good to it's good to think about that as well. Yeah, avoiding heavy, like when you've got like a bright colored background that fills up lots of you kind of app or page and you're reading like a large amount of text and you've got like, I don't know, black or red or bright color and then white text on it. I don't know about you, but I get really dizzy when I look at those or when I click away from it and then look at a white page and it blows my mind when I, when I make that transition. So, <laughs> so watch out for that. But typography, don't use jet black on white because it's just, it's the contrast is too high. Maybe those contrast ratio detectors would argue with me. But <laughs> if you look at most, a lot of websites or a lot of good brands and stuff, they will have, or, or apps even, it will be like a, a dark gray or something that's not like so intense when you're reading it or when you're viewing your screen for prolonged periods of time when you're using the app. So just watch out for that. Typography again is too big for today, but something to think about. Um, I, I guess the, the biggest takeaway again is consistency and, and just, narrowing down your options don't don't go crazy with the amount that you choose choose a typeface that works well at various sizes particularly with app design you want to make sure it's readable legible at small sizes um, so you're looking at letter forms making sure that everything is legible you can get some really nice fonts and you think you've hit gold and then you'll look at like the l a uh, lower uh, like a, a uppercase i and lowercase l's and they all look the same and then you know, you write the word ill and then we're in trouble. So <laughs> you need to watch out for that kind of thing. Typography is actually really important, but it's just a big subject. Um, you want to like basically optimizing your typography is, is obviously going to optimize your UI. The better, the more readable it is and the more accessible it is. And then the more usable it becomes and then the better balance and the better the aesthetic. So it's kind of, it is an important subject. White space. This is my favorite. It's really powerful and it is quite hard to master. It's very common for like junior designers or people just starting out to fill a lot of the page. We were talking about it before, but then elements are all competing for attention for the user. So it's hard to, you know, to see exactly where you need to go. So, so white space is basically good for separating sections of content, drawing attention designs with a clear, clear white space section. You can scan, you can scan the layouts more easily. You can get to where you're going just by scanning. People want to fill it. Clients always want to fill it up. It's it's the, the bane <laughs> of my existence as a designer. So like Mailchimp, good contrast here. You've got the contrasting fonts, and the colors and the designs, and then they put white space, good use of the white space leading you through. You can clearly process the information, allowing us to read the bits of content that they want us to. More Z patterns. HubSpot, again, is a nice, clean. There's a lot going on, but it still feels clean that the way they've used their spacing it feels you know it's, it's open even though it's actually really quite busy they've got a really nice font avenir which i always try to use but nobody ever wants to buy it because <laughs> it's expensive <laughs> but yeah good use of white space throughout patterns rather than creating your wires with crazy blue boxes and pictures of lemony snickets i got him you don't need to invent the wheel you can just use existing libraries or, you know, if you do create your, you can create your own if you, if you do, you know, really get into it. Again, like, it depends what you're designing, but for the most part, you want to keep that familiarity with your users. And so you can just get a, a decent library. Also, it takes the strain out of building, of even producing your wireframes, because you can churn through them much quicker and focus on the important part, which is delivering the content and the message to the client to, for approval. Basically, it's yeah, all about just that familiar pattern, letting, letting users draw on their experience from other <clears throat> apps that they've interacted with. So I think that one's fairly straightforward. And then lastly is consistency. We've said it, we've spoken about it already throughout. But yeah, users will learn faster if your UI is, or learn how to use your UI faster if you keep it consistent. You know, eliminate confusion, eliminate that, uh, the friction in the design. Basically just, you know, colors, pans, fonts, paddings, margins, white space, everything just keep it no matter what you choose just keep it consistent are there any other numbers like that you know you mentioned kind of having a you have like a 40 pixel whatever thing that you base all your padding off of are there any other ones like that that are just kind of like your personal go-to you can think of right now when you're choosing when you're working with fonts when you're working with text 16 pixels what's that in in developer language is that one m is it for legible uh, body content maybe 24 for a i mean it obviously depends you know you don't have to because otherwise, if you, if, you, if you keep sticking to it, all of your work's going to end up looking the same. Again, especially with wireframes, I do kind of kind of stick to what I know 
maybe too much. The 16 pixels is the smallest font size you like to use. It's the smallest font size I like to use for good readability. If the goal is having your users, you know, be able to read and process what you're saying, then 16 is good. You can go lower. Obviously, you have to go lower with app design because there's just not enough space, which is why you need to choose a font which is readable at very small levels, which is why I like Avenir, for example. They're very good at all sizes. Maybe like 24 for subheadings, larger for 28, 32 for main headings. And you want to go, maybe you want to go bigger. It depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to, you know, you might want to go bold and brash and go heavier than that. And then as a general rule for line heights, anywhere from 140% to 180%, the size of the font for your line height. So like, you know, 1.4, 1.6, 1 1.8 is good for having a good, you know, Good line height between so body content yeah anywhere between 1.4 1.8 headers maybe a bit less because if you're using a larger header uh, and then you stick in a 1.8 line height it's going to become quite spaced out so maybe i might drop that to 1.2 if i'm talking about an h1 tag if i'm thinking about just go to numbers yeah and it's the true cost <laughs> of ownership of the of adding content i guess it's like much in the same way as developers i think when we think about adding a feature a year from now maintaining that feature is gonna have a cost. Like even thinking about it again is taking us away from other shit we could be doing. And it sounds mm -hmm. like maybe there's there's another cost we need to think of with filling space, just in a UI. Actually, yeah, there is a famous design kind of guy. He has like a, a 15 point kind of rule. So everything you put onto the page has got a point value. Some items might have two 1.2 points, depending on the, the what emphasis you wanna draw. So headings, images, icons, paragraph content everything's got a point value up to 15 so if you're getting up past 15 points on your page then you're putting too much content on your page and so and so it goes back to that white space thing when it makes that white space argument moot because it doesn't matter how much white space you've got because the client wants to add in more stuff but it's going over that that little golden 15 number it's becoming too hard too much information to process for, for, for the viewers and so I guess it's just like a little uh, something to think about when you're laying out your pages, basically. It's when you're laying out your pages in your app or whatever, keeping that kind of scorecard in the back of your mind when you're putting elements in the budget, yeah. And also rules are meant to be broken, so don't stick to all those numbers, don't stick to all those those layouts and grids or whatever. You know, it's, it's really fashionable now to have crazily asymmetric designs, but I don't know if you've seen them, they're, they're a bit way out for me. But. <laughs> I'm, I'm turning into a bit of a Luddite the older I'm getting. <laughs> when is skeuomorphism going to come back? I saw some guy tweeting about new morphism. I told you I was working on that project for Monty. Monty's got a wooden counter on his homepage, mate. I'm like, I'm bringing back skeuomorphism. That's it. And just keep it simple, isn't it? Like with everything else, don't go crazy with your pictures of lemony.